Okay, well, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Um, my name is Liming Wang. I'm hosting the seminar with Dr. Miguel Ficliazzi. For today, we are very pleased to have uh, Gregory McFarlane. Uh, uh, Dr. McFarlane is a analyst at uh, WSP and uh, BP Parsons uh, PB Parsons Berkhoff. And for today, we will talk to on uh, a topic uh, I believe is pretty hot nowadays: uh, big data and the future of travel demand modeling. Uh, with that, I will give the room to Dr. McFarlane. Great, thanks. Big big data and the future of travel demand modeling. It's a um, it's a pretty big title. We'll we'll see how well I can live up to it. Um, I hope that there's some, some interesting stuff in here. I asked this question earlier. Are, most of the people in here are, are engineers or planners, um, one or the other. How, how many of you have experience with, with travel demand modeling in your classes? Or um, Okay, one, two, two, one and a half timid hands. Um, okay, cool. Well, I just, that's good. I'll, I'll, um, it's good to calibrate what what the audience understanding is, obviously. So just about me, um, I have degrees from BYU and Georgia Tech. Um, and before joining PB, I was with the Utah Transit Authority in Salt Lake City doing uh, long-range planning. And then the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, which is a UC Davis-led uh, research group. Um, and now I'm with WSP Parsons Off, And also, um, I do some work on the side with a startup called Transport Foundry that does a lot of this uh, big data modeling uh, in, in transportation. So that, that's me. Um, the systems analysis group at, at WSP, we, we build and apply uh, advanced travel demand models, activity-based models, and uh, we just have finished up uh, leading the um, Oregon Statewide Integrated Model Project out here, which has brought me out here a lot and is how Li Ming uh, got to know me. Um, so just an outline for my talk today. We can't talk about the future without understanding the past and where, where we've been. Um, we're going to talk about how, how data might help us look at challenges that we face today and then also what, what's coming in the future with, with data and travel modeling in general um, and how, how the future travel models may or may not look like the models that we've been building and running for the last 50 years. So a brief history. Um, don't use this as like reference dates or time periods or anything. This is very hand wavy, wishy washy in terms of like dates of things. So don't don't base your um, term paper on it. Just uh, understand the basic uh, the basic eras. So uh, first question is what is the point of a travel model? Um, this is a, I, I mean this uh, literally not existentially in terms of what am I doing with my life. Um, this is more, you know, what, why, do, why do we as communities need travel models? Um, and I think a good answer to this question um, was given, I, I overheard Eric Miller say this at a conference once. He says, the purpose of travel forecasting is not to predict the future, uh, but to make informed decisions now. Because um, predicting the future is really hard for anybody. And if you look at travel models in the 70s, they were all wrong, not because the modeling was bad, but because uh, women entering the workforce was the biggest thing that changed in transportation, and that was not something that could have been or was tried to be modeled. Um, so those changing behaviors end up making much bigger differences in terms of transportation outcomes than you know, policies. Or, and so having a model that is sensitive to policy changes but also tries to guess at what future behavior might look like is, is, has been a fool's errand. Um, so we build our, our models now to look at, to be sensitive to policies that people want to, um, people want to study and want to forecast so that we can choose the right policy for today looking forward, not necessarily be right on the money in 20 years about what, um, what the ca highway count on one of these bridges is going to be. So I, I understand this may be small font. Uh, Four-step trip modeling process. You have trip generation, 
trip distribution, mode choice, and then assignment. Is this, is this familiar to, okay, I see nods, more, more, more assertive nods than the travel modeling question earlier. Um, the framework for this model, and the reason why I start over here on the left is there are inputs to a travel model. Um, and these inputs, you really, you can't have a travel model without a travel survey of some kind. You have to go out and you have to ask people, how many trips did you make today? Where are the places you went to? Who came with you on those trips? If you don't, if you don't understand that, then your model has nothing to really run on. Um, so we talk about inputs to a travel model. There's, there's the socioeconomic data for the zones. There's the highway network. But really what's driving the model is the surveyed responses. You go out and you ask about a few thousand people, give me a list of all the places you went today and yesterday and the next day. Um, and in exchange, I'm going to give you a $20 Amazon gift card, and uh, thanks for all your data. Um, that's worked pretty well for us for a long time, but that's changing, and you can sort of imagine why. But we'll get to those changes later. Um, so early, early prehistory of travel models, sort of tracing old computers. Uh, this is not a model, this is not a computer used in travel modeling. It's the Harvard Mark II. Um, but when they were building the interstate highway system, somebody had the, the idea, maybe we should think about what these roads are, where they're going to go and where the smartest place to build them is going to be. So they came up with pretty simple models, but that, that framework that they established still exists today. I call it a three-step model because they didn't have a way to do mode choice at that time. Um, they sort of, if, if there were people who took transit, they just sort of took them out, which is what we still do in a lot of places where the transit system isn't um, real robust today. But even, you know, Detroit and Chicago, they would just throw away the non-auto uh, non trips. Um, one of my early mentors uh, built the first travel model for the Salt Lake City uh, metropolitan region, and uh, he told me that they would rent um, they would rent computer time from the Mormon Church because the Mormon Church was the only organization in Utah that owned a computer. Um, so that that was sort of the early early days of of travel forecasting. Um, in the 60s, and then leading into the 70s and 80s, uh, the multinomial logit model was derived. So Daniel McFadden, economist at Berkeley, uh, he and his graduate students. Uh, are trying to forecast ridership for the BART system. And they derive this uh, multinomial logit model where people, the, the, the framework is I'm going to pick the alternative that gives me the best utility, that has the most reward. But it's really hard to measure what that is, so let's model the random error in a very particular way. And if you pick a particular way of, of modeling that error, you get this framework, um, and for his efforts, he was given the Nobel Prize. So it, it's a pretty important idea. Suddenly, we can now use quantitative models to look at discrete choices, you know, choosing do I drive or do I take transit. Um, this, this model did have a weakness. I'm going to uh, move to the board just for a second. Um, the multinomial logit model assumes that every choice, the error term is distributed equally across the three. But the problem with that is if you have transit, and if you have, um, let's say this is rail, and this is bus, and this is auto, rail and bus have much more in common than they do with auto. So then the thought is, well, let's make what they call the nested logit model, where somebody chooses between auto and transit, and then conditional on the, on the choice of transit, they choose bus or rail. So this, this formula is not really complicated, but it's a lot more complicated than the last one. Um, and then the thought was, well, what other choices could we, could we model in this way? So we've, we've talked about mode choice. How about instead of um, saying, I'm gonna, this household makes 4.2 trips per day, why don't we take a household and model how many trips they choose to make? 
So turn that into a discrete choice problem as well. Do, do they make one or two or three trips per day? And then, then the question becomes, well, which, which of those alternatives are more similar than the others, and how can we structure this to be, uh, to be smart? So from about 2005 until now, we, we've been in a period I call choice model mania, where, um, and I think this is good. I, I don't want to disparage the, those who are working in this field. Um, there are a lot, every, every year there are you know, several new discrete choice frameworks that come out that try to represent um, a different set of choices that people may face. So you have, um, you know, destination choice came around a few years ago where people uh, faced with all the different places that they could go to shop, they choose the place that they go to. And that could be based on, you know, how far away it is or the amenities that are there. Um, auto ownership. How many vehicles am I going to choose to own? And is that a function of, you know, the density and the socioeconomics around me? Maybe it's a function of where I've chosen to live and where, to, and where I've chosen to work. So you, you see how all these choices can be modeled. Um, we even get into coordinated choice. The, the activity-based models that my firm has been delivering for the last several years have um, people within a household choose the destinations and the trips that they make based on the choices of the people in their household. So maybe maybe the place you, you want to go to dinner is the same place your wife wants to go to dinner at. And modeling that is, is convenient for lots of good reasons. Um, but this has become really complicated. And these extra sensitivities and these extra alternatives and these extra sets have really demanded more from the data that we collect. And that, that's why I've sort of gone through this history. When you have an aggregate model, you can be satisfied with a, a pretty, pretty minimal household travel survey. When you start getting into all these minute choices, you have to observe people who are choosing those alternatives. So then you have to go and ask people, okay, well, instead of just giving me your diary for the day, give me the diary of everybody in your household for the day and who went with each other to all of those different places. Um, and if we don't get a good response from the household, you know, like one of their, a couple of their members couldn't complete the survey or they didn't want to tell us where they went to work, um, then that data becomes not useful anymore. So the, the costs of, really, of collecting the data have gone up just from, just from the demand that we've placed on what the models need. Um, the, just stepping back a little bit, when you, when you create a travel demand model from a chain of choices, it really is what an activity-based model is. You choose the activity, people in the model choose the activities that they go to. Um, but in the end, you still start in the same place with a household travel survey, and you still end in the same place with some sort of network assignment. Um, the actual models in the middle may be different, and they may be more sensitive, but the starting place is the same. Um, so then the question is, how, how is now different from the 1960s? Uh, and it's different in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of transportation, though, back in the 60s, behavior was, was more or less stable in terms of where people went and how they, how they behaved. Um, and the infrastructure was what was changing substantially. You were building a new interstate system. You're building MARTA and BART and b these big transit networks from the ground up. Um, that's not true anymore. Now behavior is changing rapidly. And the infrastructure, a lot of it is staying the same or even deteriorating. One of, one of the big applications that ODOT wants to use their, um, or has been using their statewide model for, is actually modeling disinvestment. Like which bridges can we close? Or which bridges can we put rate restrictions on and still have a running economy? Uh, that's, that's a very different set of questions from the questions that travel models were, were built on. Um, there's lots of data out there now. It's just not maybe in the right format uh, for travel modeling. And that's what's going to be the, the, the bulk of my presentation is how, how do we use these data that aren't surveys but that could still be useful. And the reason why uh, we – related to, to data, there's the machine learning and artificial intelligence, which you know, can take all these different data sets and, and process them together. With a survey, you have to ask the person uh, who's taking it all the questions you need from them to model their behavior. With 
big data, there may not be a single data set out there that can give us all the answers we need. So the skill is how do we take one data set and join it to another one so that we can get some useful stuff out of it. So, so big, big data. I've, I've said this several times in my presentation. How many of you have not heard of the phrase big data? Okay, good. So then what on earth is big data? Um, there are a few different definitions for it. Lots of, sometimes when you see people talking about big data, what they are talking about is like, astronomical uh, you know, microphysics data where it occupies racks and racks and racks of server space and the data is so big you can't run standard statistics on it because no computer can calculate that statistic. Um, that, that's one type of big data. Lots and lots of volume. There's another type of big data though and that's data everywhere. Um, it's, it's the idea that every Everything you do is somehow recorded somewhere. Um, when you sign up for a bank account, the bank, you know, takes takes your takes your loan information, and you know, sends it to a credit reporting agency, who records, you know, how much how much money you said you made, and you know, then they sell that on as part of your credit report, uh, so that you can get another loan in the future. Um, when you make a call on your cell phone, your cell phone towers uh, point out your location. So just, just for the ability for the carrier to make your call, it's not that they want to know where you are all the time. It's just in order to provide you the service, they have to know where you are so that their, their uh, physical infrastructure can work. So a useful definition uh, is from this consultancy Gartner, high volume, high velocity, and high variety information assets that demand cost-effective innovative forms of information processing for enhanced insight and decision making. That's a lot of corporate speak, but the idea here is, is important that data that comes in lots of different formats all the time um, in lots of, for lots of different purposes. Um, and then these, the skill of a modern data scientist is using those different types of data instead of just hoping that the data you get comes in the right form you, you've always wanted it in. So big data and transportation, the, some of the types that, that exist and that have been used. A lot of work has gone into cellular and GPS traces. I mentioned these. There are companies like Streetlight and AirSage that sell um, data sets that they pull from cell phone carriers or from onboard GPS systems. Um, they sell these along as, as origin destination matrices. So you can, you can call up AirSage and they'll give you you know, this many thousand people went from this point to this point in a period of time. Um, and that's useful information. Uh, there's probe data uh, from the GPS traces. You can, you know, look at a link of highway and they'll tell you how fast cars move on it at different times of the day. Um, and that's really useful too. Highway departments used to have to send somebody out to go drive a road back and forth to measure how fast the traffic was flowing on it. Now they can pull that data from, from these providers. Um, I mentioned also targeted marketing, credit reports. Uh, this is a data set that's not really been explored a lot, but has great potential. Um, you can go to a credit reporting agency and purchase uh, data on, on people. Um, the main audience of this is like marketers. So L.L. Bean will call up TransUnion or Experian or, or one of these other companies and say, can I have the address of everybody in Portland who might want to buy a kayak? And then you get a catalog in your mail that you know, has your name on it and your address, and it's because somewhere in their algorithm, they decided that you might want to buy the thing that's in that catalog. Well, travel modelers could, could use that information too, and they're starting to. You could go buy a, a stack of data on people in the metropolitan area you're looking at, and then you can look at, okay, well, where do rich people live? Where do poor people live? What are household structures like? Um, are, is one neighborhood maybe more interested in traveling, and are they going to go to the airport more frequently because of that? Um, there, there's data there that, that can be mined. Um, administrative records. Uh, sometimes people don't usually think of state governments as being in the big data game, um, but they really are in terms of, like, um, DMV records, you, you can get um, 
you know, with certain research permissions, you can you can get you know the type of vehicle and whether it passed its emissions inspection in the last year, how many vehicles are owned by a household, and all of this just comes from a state agency collecting this data to do their job. Tax tax records are one that are used a lot in in urban planning. You can get tax assessed values on properties. That's a type of big data. It, it exists for a purpose other than just a survey that was collected. It exists because some agency or some company needed to do a function. Um, Android location data. If you have an Android phone, Google knows where you are and what you're doing a lot of the time, which for me is cool. For other people, it's scary. Um, just, yeah. So, and then there are others, obviously. So I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that I've done um, that sort of illustrate how we can do things now. Uh, so the first one, there's a, there's a question about who, who fails their emissions tests. Um, and if, if, you, if you put a stiffer penalty on vehicles that fail emissions, who's that going to hurt? Or if you put in some policy that you know, helps people pass their emissions test, who does that benefit go to? Um, so what, what we did was we, we bought targeted marketing records for um, about a 10% sample of Atlanta. Um, I should also mention that these big data are often very cheap. Like a, a, a survey will cost a few hundred dollars per record to collect it and, and process it and do everything. Big data records can come for pennies per record. So that, that's another useful thing. But we bought a big stack of, of targeted marketing records in Atlanta. And then we set up a research agreement with the Georgia Department of Transportation, and we joined these two data sets together. So now we knew, you know, um, the vehicle characteristics, you know, what kind of car it is, how many miles are on it. Also, did it pass or fail its inspection last year? And then on the other side, from the targeted marketing records, we know, is this a wealthy household? Is this a minority household? Um, does this household like to buy books? You know, <laughs> there are lots of variables in that data set that we could have used. We, we didn't use all of them. But for the first time, we were able to, you know, actually look at do certain types of people pass their emissions inspection more, more frequently than others, even when controlling for other things. And, you know, in, in, in some ways, we, we came, we've had troubling findings. You know, minorities and lower income people are more likely to fail their emissions test, even driving the same car, um, even given the same car. So then with that understanding, what policies might be used to improve vehicle emissions? So we came up with a, a few test policies um, extended exemptions, Georgia allows vehicles newer than three years to not be tested. We said, well, you know, this is a tax on testing because so few cars fail their emissions test. So what if we extended that to five years? Well, we would have missed 2,000 cars that failed their emissions test, and all the benefit basically was going to wealthy households that owned three- and four-year-old cars. So that's not maybe a great policy, and it definitely has equity problems. Uh, Another one was a maintenance subsidy. What if we find households on food stamps and give them enough money to get an oil change every year? Um, and maybe, maybe the hope is in there that by keeping their car well-maintained, emissions would be improved. Um, doing that allowed us to, you know, allowed 430 vehicles to uh, pass their emissions that wouldn't have otherwise. Um, but the cost of this program was $19,000 per avoided failure. So it would have been cheaper to, you know, pick a set of random households and buy them a new car. Um, that, that might have been more, more effective policy uh, and, and certainly more, more affordable. Um, this benefit does, however, go entirely to the poor. The last one is the Cash for Clunkers program, which was a big thing a few years ago. Um, the government provided, would, would buy your old car and trash it instead of selling it along to somebody else. Uh, and the hope was we could destroy these old cars instead of letting them keep running. Um, doing, modeling that scenario for the Atlanta metropolitan region avoided 95 vehicle emissions failures at a cost of $60,000 per failure. So now, instead of you know, just buying somebody a, a, a small, nice running car, we're now buying luxury vehicles uh, for, you know, as, as a equivalent policy. So cash for clunkers did not come out very well in our study as being an effective, effective uh, tool. Uh, second study, 
that sort of did a, a similar thing was we took, well, the question is, does the built environment change travel behavior? Um, this is a really old chicken and egg question in transportation planning. Um, do people who live in Portland bike and walk everywhere because of the way Portland is built? Or do people who want to bike and walk everywhere move to Portland? Um, that, that's, the, that's the section. That's, that's the second option. Um, do, do they pick where they live so that they can live the lifestyle they want to live? And this is actually a big deal because if you just densify an area, but you don't put people who want to walk and bike there, are they going to walk and bike as much? Or then the second question is, after you put those people there, do they learn how to live a different lifestyle than, than, than they grew up with? Um, is, is, is there something about the built environment that can change their, their behavior? And d data on this is really hard to come by. Um, some studies have, have looked at people who've moved recently. Others have asked them, have tried to ask attitudinal questions. Like, do you like to walk and bike? Is that why you chose to live in this place? And, and those, those can get you a long way, but they're, they tend to be small samples. And it's really hard to ask the right survey question to get that, that answer back, although the people who've done, who've done that have, have done it well. Um, so what we did is your credit report has your address history on it. So then we could build a score for how much exposure to uh, density or, or urban or you know, good urban development you've had in your past. Um, in terms of like understand or an analogy, what, what we did was if you take two households in suburban Atlanta, one of whom has always lived in suburban Atlanta and one of whom had lived in New York City or Portland for their entire life, do they now have different vehicle ownership? Um, and statistically, yes, they do. That was, that, was, that was the finding of our study. Somebody who's been exposed in the past to transit use or, or dense urban environments tends to own fewer vehicles, even when controlling for their current built environment. So there's some sort of learned preference that people, people carry with them. Um, in terms of how strong that is, though, that, this, is, this is a question. So these are a few of the scenarios we ran. The reference is just the data set as we had it. Um, in the past equals present, what we did is, what if we assumed that people never moved and they had always lived exactly where, where they were living now? I mean, in that case, the number of vehicles in Atlanta would grow by 1.2%. For a mean past, what we did was we said, what if everybody had the same history, the same, uh, you know, we averaged the histories of everybody. In that case, it, it dropped the vehicle ownership. Fewer people owned cars because more people had come from Chicago and New York, part of, you know, the Sun Belt migration to Atlanta. Um, random past, what if we just randomly assigned somebody's? And it ended up not changing very much. And then these percentiles, what we did was we said, what if everybody in our sample had come from a neighborhood that was in the first percentile of, like, really super sprawling, no transit access at all? Um, it, would have, it would have increased the auto ownership by 6%, or the number of cars, I guess, not by 6%. So in terms of whether that's a, um, an important finding for policy, it's a, good, it's a good thing to understand. If you're going to build a mixed-use transit-oriented development, you need to understand that you know, the people who live there may not immediately adopt the lifestyle you want to. There is going to be some memory of the experiences that they've had in the past. So. All right. This has been just big data looking at the, some, some sort of questions we have now. Um, what if we took these data sets and built a, a new and different model from them. So what we've, what we've done with, with my friend at Transport Foundry is we've taken, we've thrown away the survey. We're, we're no longer using a travel survey in the, in the, in the common sense. What, what, we're, what we have is we have um, consumer data, these, these targeted marketing data. We have uh, firm data, which is information, it's basically the same thing but on companies. And then we have travel data, which is a, um, a cellular origin destination matrix. And we've built an engine that takes these three data sets and processes them together um, to build a travel diary, a, a synthetic travel diary for the population. Um, 
an analogy for how for how this this process works is um, if a travel modeler were wanting to model a queue at a bank, uh, what they would do is they would ask one percent of the people who come into that queue everything about their experience at the bank. You know, what time did you come? How long did you wait in line? Did you like you know the service you got? Lots, lots of different questions. A systems modeler would count the people coming in and count the people coming out, and then that would be the process that they would build their model on. Uh, so we, we sort of took a systems engineering approach to this, to this, uh, to this model. Um, and we compared it against, we, we did this in Asheville, North Carolina, and we compared it against the, the model that the MPO is currently using. So on the left here, we have uh, the standard four-step trip-based model that the MPO has been, uh, that my firm actually developed for the MPO. And on the right, we have this totally new framework um, where we just take synthetic households and we uh, build diaries for them just based on a, a population synthesis type process. Um, and as you can see, we, we, we match pretty well. Um, you know, if we take off the take off the, the small roads, we, we, we do, you know, nicely. Um, this, this, this graphic shows as, um, shows the deviation from the counted volume. And within this green, within this gray area is sort of the, um, sort of accepted deviation on this plot. Um, this trip based model, however, on the left, um, got this way after several months of calibration. Re rejiggering, reconfiguring the, the, the calibration coefficients so that it would match like this. The DES model, the discrete event simulation model, um, this is what it looked like the first time out. Um, so we could go in and do some, some further calibration and uh, potentially get similar results. Um, but we were, we were happy with this because it's like, wow, it worked. Uh, we, didn't, we really didn't know it was going to come out when, when we did this. Um, these are just trip length frequency distributions, and it sort of captures one of the good things about this model. So in this middle column is uh, home-based work trips, and the light green is the four-step model, and the dark green is, is our model. Um, and at first, you would look at this and say, wow, they're, they're missing a lot of home-based work trips in the PM. Um, where, where are those trips? But if you look, we actually have more uh, non-home-based trips in the midday, PM, and night. And what this is capturing is, in a trip-based model, people who go to work come back from work. There, there's no extra activity that they can do. In our, in our synthetic uh, diary generation, um, it does a lot of things that an activity-based model does in terms of, if I go to work in the morning, on my way home from work, I might do another activity. I might go to a concert, I might go to dinner, and then my trip happens at a different purpose and in a different period. And so we're, we're reflecting that with this, that sensitivity with this model uh, that you don't get with four-step models. Similarly, in a four-step model, um, all the flows have to be symmetrical. Um, it's just part of the process. Um, in, in our model, they don't have to be. But as you see, in terms of general flows into and out of Asheville, the, the general shape is, is similar. So we, we were, again, happy with that uh, calibration result. This, um, we then put it into, a, into a, a, a program called MATSIM. Instead of using the static assignment from the trip model, we, we put it into this discrete event simulation driven network assignment where each trip tries to load onto a link and then uh, people can readjust their plans so that if a, if a highway corridor was really congested or really expensive, they would change the time they left or change the time they departed. Um, so what I'm showing here is we put a toll on the expressways that uh, ring the center of Asheville, um, and the toll started at 7 a.m. Um, to get their current trip-based model to, to do this would have been a, a pretty substantial amount of work. What you're seeing here is these blue, these blue links at 645 uh, indicate that there's more traffic on them than there was in a base assignment. And the orange links indicate that there's less traffic. So what happens with this model is um, when the toll goes in at 7 a.m., 
people leave the freeway or they readjust their plan to leave a little bit earlier before the toll kicks in. Um, that readjustment of your departure time isn't something that it, their trip-based model can handle. Um, our model handled it very easily and very quickly, um, and that was that was nice. So where where could we where could we go from here? Um, our model doesn't have any choices in it. What it does is it looks at um, National Household Travel Survey data and says, okay, well, the number of trips per household um, has a distribution that might look like this. Okay. And so then in the engine, households, when they decide how many trips they're going to make, they just pull a random number from this distribution. So in some ways, this is not as sensitive to things like an activity-based model when a household is trying to decide how many trips it's going to make, it will look at, well, how much congestion is there? And if there's more congestion, then I'm going to make fewer trips. So this model is insensitive to things like that. Um, but a couple weeks ago, you had, you had Brian Greger here who talked about that systems, uh, the fuzzy systems uncertainty model. You could do a very similar thing um, in this framework where, well, what if I have a scenario where I assume that trips are going to increase? Well, you could give the model a different probability distribution and shift it a little bit more. And this would, this would let you answer questions about what, is, what are AVs going to do my, to my system much more quickly and easily than um, the current activity-based models can do. The AV question is um, it's the question that every, all our planning agencies are asking. What's going to happen with AVs? What are the transportation effects going to be of AVs? So travel modelers are scrambling to find a, a to fit this AV problem into their existing framework. Um, well, what if we let them choose how many, whether they take an AV or not, and it has to be sensitive to this, so let's wrap it around, and it becomes a really complicated thing. Um, and the truth is we don't know what AVs are going to do. So let's have a system that's flexible and let's, uh, let's us explicitly model that uncertainty. Let's look at all the different options that might happen. Um, another thing, right now we pull origin destination matrices from providers like AirSage or Streetlight that measure, measure flows that happen. One of the things that I would really like to do is um, replace those matrices with an AI that, uh, so, so right now, so we have our origin destination matrix. If we know where our firms are and where our people are with your socioeconomic data, and we have these, this origin destination matrix that we can get from a cell phone provider, you could build an AI around these two objects. Um, and then when, when the firms change, the AI would be able to predict how the origin destination matrix changes. Um, right now, the real weak point in a lot of our travel models is this destination choice problem. Because where you choose to go is partially a function of the distance, but there are a lot of other things in it, too, that we, we can't model and we don't understand. Um, current destination choice models have a lot of calibration in them. They, there are a lot of knobs that you twist and adjust so that your model matches the data that you collected. Uh, but it ends up happening that those knobs end up meaning more to the model than the actual sensitivities that are built into it. So replacing it with an AI is a real interesting direction to go and a, a real potential for um, improving travel modeling. It would, however, mean that the model's not sensitive to some of the things that we think a model should be sensitive to now. And then that, that comes to the question of, well, why, why are we travel modeling? Why, why are we doing this? Uh, should the travel model of tomorrow look like the travel model that we've been running for 50 years? Questions? Thanks. Thanks for letting me come.
más. Uh, Richard Henry. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, so we had like a big snowstorm here the other day. Yeah. And well, not the other day, a little while ago. And the city only has like a limited number of uh, snow plows. And so they have to make a decision what what streets to snow plow and how often who goes first and stuff like that. So would that model be able to help make a decision like that, based on just uh, if they if the you ask the system to choose the most efficient way of getting people around with like. 50 snowplows we have in the city. Yeah, I mean, so so the MATSIM model that we applied at the end could do that fairly easily, I think. The problem with, with a tra the full-blown travel demand model is people aren't going to change their whole daily activity pattern because of the snowstorm, right? Or because of which links are or are not open. They'll change their behavior for that day and they'll find another way to get home. Um, MATSIM, you can model like disturbances, like traffic accidents that shut down a bridge. You, and it, 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 you can do more short-term readjustment of, of your day. Um, it would, I mean, this, this is a, a resiliency question in a lot of ways, and that, that's something that agencies look at, like which links are the most important, which combination of links can we keep open to, uh, to use. Does that answer your question? Or? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure I answered it well. Um, I mean, it, it's something that people look at. I'm not. I'm not sure that our framework is particularly better than existing ones. Oh yeah. Would you like be able to like model just like a black swan event like that? Something that will just totally wreck the model, I guess, or just like maybe mess with people's expectations of how more they can go. I'm not sure, but it'd be really fun to try. <laughs> <laughs> is we don't know what the behavior impacts of AVs are going to be. And, and nobody can really tell you that. Um, 
Like we don't know what the theory should be. Um, so how how do you how do you address how do you address a problem when you can't even like really put down the theory for it? And that, that's what a lot of research is doing is trying to come up with the theory of what AVs are going to do. Um, I guess what what my idea he, here would be is. You know, you, you think the trips are going to increase under ABs. I might think the trips are really going to cut down under ABs, right? That's probably not a good assumption. They probably will increase. But you can get a whole bunch of different options about what this curve will look like in the future, and then you could model all of them and see which, res which results are robust, right? So you can take, you know, several different runs of this model with different probability assumptions, different futures assumptions, and then if, if, the, um, if the Columbia River Bridge always needs a toll on it under every one of those scenarios, then they should put a toll on it because that, that's a robust finding. Um, and I think a lot of policies are going to be like that. On the other hand, if, if this new infrastructure project that you're, you're, you're looking at really only makes sense in three of the 100 scenarios you tested, don't do that infrastructure project. Um, and I think that that's a much more um, – it's a much more comfortable, uh, comfortable assumption for me is that we don't know what the future is going to be. Let's model all different reasonable outcomes and then go down the path that's the most resilient or the most robust instead of what we're doing now, which is, well, we think we really, really understand what's happening here, and if you do that, then you'll get an increase of 2%. And that, that's, that's giving a lot more credit to the model than, than the model deserves. And, you know, does that 2%, what's the margin of error on that 2%? It's probably big. Um, so having, having an uncertain framework may actually be better for that kind of thing. Any others? What if we file the details back? The best possible option. We can oh, find yeah. all these scenarios in the system, and everything just comes out to be a wash. You, yeah. you can't logically make any decision based on that. What do you do with the model then? Then I think the politicians have to make a decision based on the values that they have, which is where it comes down to a lot eventually. I mean, in, in some ways, politicians have leaned on these models um, to justify or refute programs that they do or don't want rather than you know, using them as sort of um, neutral, apolitical arbiters of, of policy discussion. I think, I think in the end, there are always going to be values in play. And if our best guesses at what may or may not happen in the future don't lead us to a clear outcome, then let those values make the decision and don't, don't worry too much about the quantitative things that you can't really quantitate. One way or another, you have to make some decision, even if it's just I don't want to make the decision. Yeah, I mean, so so if if let's let's go back to Columbia River Tolls example, if we come up with all these different scenarios and it makes sense in half of them and it doesn't make sense in half of them, um, then that goes back to the politicians and the decision makers. Do you, why are you putting the toll on the bridge? What what are you trying to accomplish with that? Does that make sense? Because our model will tell you that. It, in terms of outcomes, we really don't know what the outcome will be. And I think, I think becoming uncomfortable with that uncertainty, becoming comfortable with that uncertainty is going to be an important thing in the future. Yeah. So this is a pretty broad question, and I know that we don't have time for a full addressing of it, but I was wondering when you're working with big data sets like this, or with big data like this, how do you choose what's relevant, what to put in, and what to leave out? Or do you just try throwing it all in and see what happens and then decide what to take out? So in the studies that I've looked at, we have um, studies that I showed you today. Um, we did start from a theory. Like we, we, had, we had somebody's previous paper. They had these variables in it. Let's tweak these variables with this new data set and see if they show something different or, or confirmatory. Um, I guess I guess you're looking at like you know machine learning. What if we just throw in a big data set and look at what comes out of it? I think that that can be really useful, and I think that it can you know guide you to the variables that probably do or don't matter. 
Um, one of the things I do a lot is cluster analysis. So I'll get a data set and I'll let the computer tell me how to group things instead of asserting that, well, I think they should be grouped in this way. Um, and doing that has, has led to some interesting outcomes and, and findings that um, I, I might not have gotten to if I just assumed that, well, zones can be classified in this way. You know, this is interesting, you know, it's a yeah. different approach to come to like an old problem. So what about trying to use this as a complement? You know, I I kind of got the impression that you were saying, well, maybe we can replace, <laughs> but yeah. what about if you can pick and choose or complement, um, you know, more than one approach, and then, you know, what would be the kind of the pros and cons of or the strengths of this versus the traditional one? Or how, how to kind of, in a way, yeah. I assume that it's not, um, we can't expect that the old models are going to go away. Right. Yeah. So I think they're going to live together eventually this uh, kind of approach is successful. So how do you see that transition in terms of uh, using both models or both approaches? To so I think, um, you know, it sort of has a similar answer to, to what Li Ming asked about was, um, I think that this model is particularly good at looking at short-term forecasts. Like, um, TriMet needs to reorganize its bus route in the next two years. What are the What is the effect of that going to be? I think that this this kind of framework would be much better at that than the activity-based model that that Portland is is using currently, which is quite poor at something like that, or could be poor at something like that. The the activity-based modeling framework is looking much, much more long-term um, in terms of its usefulness. Um, and I think that, yeah, this lightweight framework that can be spun up really quickly with existing data is, is great for short-term analyses, especially right at the moment. So that, that may, my answer to that may change if an AI can tell us what the future origin destination patterns are going to be uh, based on changes in, in underlying data. Going back to that, isn't that that you know, garbage in, garbage out. So yeah. if you feed the AI model data from the 90s to the 2000s <laughs> with that structure, why do you expect that that model would be better after predicting what's going to happen in 2020? So that's... that's yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, the, I haven't done the AI yet because it's going to be hard. And I don't, I don't really know that it would work. But the, um, I guess I'm coming at it from the opposite side of the, the discrete, the destination choice models we have now don't work very well. And what, what could we, what could we do instead? Um, but yeah, so, so a, a, a more quick answer to your question is, also smaller communities, who, who need to look at things like tolls, like Asheville, North Carolina is not going to have an activity-based model, um, because activity-based models are expensive. But if they wanted to put a demand responsive toll on their facility, they'd want to model what that might do. And this kind of framework could be deployed much more quickly and much more cheaply uh, for those kinds of things. Also, because it uses sort of universally available data, you can go into a new town and spin it up much more quickly. You don't have to have, okay, well, this year we're going to collect a survey, then next year we're going to do a travel demand model development, and then we'll start our LRTP. That whole time frame can be really compressed. Which is cost yeah. in terms of you know manpower. I mean staff power in terms right. of hours. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, you can do these much more quickly. What kind of time frame can you do these in, and can it be even compressed into something that's even like sort of reactive, or is it still a uh, yeah? I mean, could you do real time or anything like that? You could talk about doing like an AI structure and stuff. Like yeah. That. Okay. So the. Um, so AirStage data, you can get new data every month, right? So you could have a constantly updating travel, like a self-updating travel model. You don't have to look at, you know, what the survey collected back in 2012. Um, so in terms of, I, I don't know if that is up to your real time or not. Well, yeah, I'm not um, sure either. I was just kind of asking, yeah. like, what? So, so for comparison, the Asheville model, they spent a year collecting the survey data and processing it, and then about a year developing the model and calibrating it. Um, we got this framework up and running in three months 
working nights and weekends only. Um, so it was it was much much faster and much cheaper. Um, and then we can always get, you know, next year if we wanted to update the model, we could get new target marketing data, get new error stage data, and the models updated to the to the next year, instead of you know a five year development cycle that most travel models are on. Um, so that that that's a big advantage too. It's also a reason why it could be useful for short-term scenario forecasting, because you can always have a new model. Another way I can potentially see is that, that this machine learning technique kind of could potentially enhance or replace some of the current econometric models. Mm -hmm. For example, a discrete choice model or destination choice model, the multinomial logic or the general discrete choice model model framework may not work best, but if you can figure out a best AI or machine learning technique, that could kind of be a marginal replacement for the destination choice model. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great point. You don't necessarily have to throw away the whole model. You could just put a better dis destination choice model in, and you'd, you'd make your existing framework a lot better immediately. Under your infrastructure influence behavior premise, yeah. how could you reverse the model to get the desired behavior? So A, B, C, encourage shared mobility, and then like um, reverse it to see what policy most strongly influences that desired outcome, or what infrastructure benefits most influences that desired outcome. Mm. So that. That's kind of a land use model question, um, and I'd love to see a more responsive land use model that could look at that kind of thing. Um, I don't. Yeah, our, I mean, ours ours takes the land use kind of as given. It takes where fe where people are and where firms are as given. Um, in terms of yeah, land use development that. I mean, that's an important area, and I think it's an area where AI could do a lot of good, too, because right now, land use models are often based in firms choosing where to locate. Again, you have a choice model. Um, let, me, let me look at all the utilities of all these zones and pick the one that makes most sense to me. Um, and, you know, you, you put in policies there in that model to say, well, let's incentivize these locations to look more attractive. But in the end, People choose where they're going to build their mall based on the the city council that gives them the best tax break. Like it's it's not it's not a so existing models for land use really don't model the way firms and households decide where to locate. So having an AI make that sort of if my transportation network looks like this, then my next land use will look like this. Um, if you could do that with an AI instead of a choice model, you might be able to look at things like that much more easily. Um, and you could do the same sort of uncertainty where you could twist the knobs in the AI um, to, to look at, well, I think AVs would have this kind of effect or that kind of effect, and how would that change if, I, if my land use was different? It's kind of circular, but yeah, I haven't looked at that, but somebody should. Any others? Yep. Thanks for. Uh,